Well, there's not much to say in this movie. Oh, unfortunately, once I start the <laughs> recording, the simulation slows down. Um, hmm, it gets kind of jerky. Here we go. No? There. A little better. When the electrons are jumpy and don't move smoothly, then you know it's being taxed. There you go. So we're not going to see many changes, but we'll, we'll get some screenshots. Here's... Here's, um, whoops, very large screenshot. Okay, so here's one screenshot. And it shows um, a high of just over 200 volts. And as it turns out, the volts are equal to the amps, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so you get exactly the same amount in units. Um, and it's all because of this transformer really changed, <laughs> transformed uh, the situation by reducing the impedance to one ohm here and also getting the volts and amps to match. But what I did was I added um, all of this because and took out the battery, which wasn't never needed anyway. I mean, it wasn't ever needed. It wasn't needed. <laughs> um, it was just a little tweak that I had put in. And that got rid of the analog switches that pop open or p toggle over immediately. So the only switch is a manual switch here. And I haven't mentioned this in any of my videos because I thought it would be obvious, but I guess it, it's worth mentioning. The light bulb lights up at around the time that it's a good point to open the switch and stop escalating the circuit. When everything is escalating into the negative direction, when the switch is closed, the lamp is, you know, black. It's not um, lit up until such times it starts to, the voltage starts to rise up to around 100 volts because the lamp is rated for 100 and um, 120 volts. So at 120 volts, it starts to light up. And then at around the time that a normal electric car would be accelerating, require a DC-oriented, a DC, um, a DC orient, yeah, a DC motor-oriented electric car, which is, this is not, this is actually the, my first simulation that is an AC-oriented, um, well, my first series, you know, all the mag amps are AC oriented because of these two diodes create um, a DC to AC inverter situation. Um, but when it reaches around just below 200 amps, it reaches full brilliance of white color index. And that's when it's a good time to shut this off because it still takes a while for the arcing downwards to turn around and start coming back upwards and be around 200 volts maximum. And I'm noticing that the bottom here gets clipped or gets raised. So it's uh, not a balanced um, charge. And it's due to the fact, I think, that I use the aerial to charge up only one side of the motor coil coils. And by the way, the motor coils is a transformer here with one half coupling coefficient to show the very poor magnetic coupling between the rotor and the stator. Um, if I connected this to both sides, it would balance it out, but it wouldn't grow. It wouldn't escalate. So escalation is based on asymmetry, such that one side of the circuit is getting the juice and the other side is getting it um, transferred indirectly throughout the circuit. And so it creates an imbalance between the top half and the bottom half of the circuit, which is the only way to make it escalate. So there's a little bit of an asymmetry here with the sine waves because over time, the bottom starts to move towards the baseline. And I don't know, maybe, <laughs> does it eventually go to the baseline and flatten out? I don't know. I'd have to run this overnight, which I'm going to do tonight. Um, but the top portion stays, actually grows slightly. And that's what I expected to happen with this snake shape of an LMD module daisy chain of seven modules, or six, actually. Yeah, six. It's not seven. Where did I get seven from? 
it's six, um, that snake around and join them so e each end of that daisy chain module to the mag amp. And it's pretty cool that I can do that instead of just having it snake in one direction. Um, so this is a pretty good circuit, con all things considered. Um, it has some problems. It taxes the simulator in a very big way, and so I've had to slow down the simulation to 10 picoseconds, and I'm trying to find out at what point does I get do I get a convergence failure error message. Um, the, the best I've been able to do is to run this circuit simulator until the time, the accumulated time, is around 30 microseconds and then it crashes. So I'm trying to see if this will go any longer, but I'm not going to make any changes. This, I'm, you know, <laughs> it's the simulator's problem, you know, it's not our fault, it's not my fault. And I can't do this in the Java version because the Java window is, is confined to about this far, this much, and then all of this gets hidden underneath, you know, the, the the right side of this, which is much wider than this is, actually. It comes out to like here. And then you don't get to have access to the switch to, t to escal you know, to put it through its paces. So, can't do it in Java, sorry. Um, let's see what else. Now, all I did was copy and paste these from this transformer extend it outwards, and then copy and paste these two um, capacitors to p be placed in here. It doesn't work to put it up here and down here, the capacitors, like the refined LMD, the is.gd forward slash refined LMD on page 110 of that PDF file. It doesn't work. So I had to put the capacitors on the, in on the inside in a standard, you know, the very first LMD or a TEM module that... Uh, uh, Eric Dollard taught us from the 1980s Borderlands videos. So that's interesting that it has to go back to square one. Um, now these are 12 capacitors in this section and here. But then I have two extras here and here that are also just like these, fixed, low level. And then I have a slightly raised one that's variable. That's the throttle capacitor. This, this regulates the frequency and thus regulates the speed of the RPMs of the AC motor. So that's why I had to put this in here to act as a regulator, but this is in parallel with the motor on the far side of the motor, opposite the power supply. So this would be attached to the motor and you wouldn't see this except under the hood, right on the motor casing. These two capacitors, um, could be adjacent to the motor, I guess, because you've got the aerial connection as well. And so they're not part of the project box. So strictly speaking, I'm upholding the story of 12 capacitors, given the fact that I'm assuming that those 12 vacuum tubes are not radio tubes, but are um, vacuum tube capacitors. But these do not have to vary, and the invention of Tesla is that they are variable because I believe there's a solenoid motor inside that regulates the standard capacitor, you know, plates, you know, that you rotate one set of plates in and out of another set of plates, and they each plate is a disc, but it's not a full disc, it's a partial disc, like three quarters of a disc or something, so you can get a variable capacitor, a variac operation. Um, but that's inside a vacuum tube. But in this case, they don't have to be variable, and so they can be fixed. And I'm sure he had them custom-made, because they did not become commercially avail available until 1942, a year before his death in 1943. So I believe he went to Buffalo, New York, to undertake this demonstration, because he had somebody there who he knew he could buy from him custom-made vacuum tube capacitors. But these would have been fixed at some value, some low value, according to my simulations, you know, be 10 picofarads or less, unless, you know, actually that's not true. It really depends on the proportional ratio between the capacitor and the inductor alongside it in an LMD module. The inductor has to be low enough to allow 
the capacitor to be able to go into escalation mode when you want it to, you know, based on what you do over here, you know, setting it up with you know, like an aerial here. And so you lower the inductance so that it doesn't get in the way, and then you lower the capacitor far enough so that the capacitor creates the magic of electricity synthesis rather than getting all the electricity chewed up by the inductor at such a fast rate that no matter what you produce by the capacitor um, still ends up being a diminishing return situation in which you're decomposing electricity not composing it not synthesizing it so you first start in your production of free energy the first thing you have to do is conserve against your losses and these are not these inductive chewings ups are not thermodynamic convert um, yeah they're not thermodynamic conversions nor are they thermodynamic losses they are the net result I, b I suspect of back EMF of the inductor so you simply lower the inductor to reduce its back EMF as well see this is uh, Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass you don't increase a components values in order to get more power from it unless you want it to chew up your source energy to a greater degree at a faster rate. But if you, it is possible though to raise the inductance to any level you want to, but this is not a linear relationship between the capacitance and the inductance. They, they, um, it's really, they both curve. If you were to plot it, they would not be straight lines, they'd be curved lines in which the distance in units of farads and units of henrys would increase or decrease depending on whether you're going up the scale or down the scale. Um, and I suspect, from my experience now that I think about it, the lower both of these values are, the closer they are to each other. So in other words, if you were to raise the inductor to something more reasonable, Let's say you raised it by a factor of a thousand. This is one micro Henry. So if you raised it to one milli Henry to make it easier for yourself to wind the darn thing because it's got 1600 to one um, inductance ratio, which is not going to be easy to wind, you know, in terms of windings. Um, but if you were to raise this to some by a factor of a thousand, you don't raise the capacitor by a factor of a thousand. You might have to raise it by a factor of a million, you know, something like, you know, it's going to be greater. It's not going to be the same. So every time you raise the inductor th by some factor, the factor you raise the capacitor is going to be more than what the factor you raise the inductor value. Um, and so it makes it easier to match them to by simply lowering both. And you start by lowering the one that chews up your production, and that's the inductor. That the inductor is, a p from what I can see, you know, theoretically, both the inductor and the capacitor can both produce and consume electricity. You know, produce as in compose it, and consume it as in decompose it back into its constituent ingredients of magnetism alone, or electrostatic voltage charge alone. Um, it's just easier this way to lower the two, and so there's really no hard, there's no hard numbers to deal with. It's really just uh, a rule of thumb that's a little loosey goose that's not precise. You know, this is not a. I'm sure it's not yet a science. Right now, it's still an art form <laughs> um, because it hasn't been studied by electrical engineers and physicists. So, you know. I have to make Lucy Goose uh, rules of thumb because, based on my experience, because that's, I haven't really methodically charted out all of the relationships, and I don't think I'm about to do that kind of grunt work. You know, there are enough people on this planet that if enough people got interested, we'd have this thing licked in no time at all, and we will in the next, in the course of the next century. I'm pretty certain of it. Whether or not I live to see it, I don't know. Um, and my intuition has been we will be talking about this subject for thousands of years so it's apparently a very deep subject and it's deep because Eric Dollard has said that the chair exists in space but electricity exists in both space and counter space simultaneously it literally has a foot in both worlds and that's the beauty of electricity is that it's so expansive 
that it takes more into consideration than just a chair, you know, and other objects and the movement of objects in space such as our bodies. You know, it, it it's really a fascinating topic, to put it mildly. So we'll probably be discussing the, this relationship between space and counter space for thousands of years, you know. It, it's just so deep. And so few people at the moment are into it. So I have to go based on Eric Dollard and my own experience, which, you know, my awareness of Eric Dollard is very limited and my experience is also limited. And so there's only so much I can contribute to this knowledge base. And it's all idealized within the realm of the simulator, which is tunnel vision. It's not false vision. It's tunnel vision. There's a big difference between the two. False di uh, a false world or a false reality means that the whole thing is has nothing to do, no relationship, no correlation to the real world as we know it. You know, if it's some other reality in, you know, the scheme of things, so be it. But it's not something we would have to ever worry about because it's not, uh, unless we're creating fiction, pure fiction. But a tunnel vision has some truth, it just doesn't have all the truth. And because it's skewed with missing facts, in a sense, it's an opinionated truth, because that's what opinions are, skewed reality, tunnel vision, an abstraction from the facts, of only certain facts to the exclusion of other facts, giving a skewed v version of reality, which is what opinions are. And so you could say that every single simulator, when the author put it together, or, uh, or group of authors, they were creating an opinion of the theory behind electrodynamic engineering. And I that's good. That's, that's fine because it makes it easier for me, but it makes it harder for all of you who want to build it or want me to build it. And I'm not about to because I know it's going to be more difficult than the amount of difficulty I've gone through this already. So my advice to you <laughs> is get on simulators as part of your experience, but also, you know, if you're well healed in bench experience, You'll need that, too, and you'll need both to be able to translate, and I don't have both, and I'm restricted to just one, and so I can't do the translation. I can make suggestions, but that doesn't guarantee success, as I've already found out, along with one other person. Um, so all I can do is try to guess estimate how I can make improvements to make building my simulations one step easier, one step more realistic. But ultimately, there's going to be a limit, and that's what people have pointed out, and it's true. The simulator does have its limits. But it is possible to try to get close to reality, to try to think, well, what are the problems? The problems usually are inductance, either in a piece of wire or a coil of wire. That's usually where the problem always lies. And one of the problems right away that I can tell you and I'm going to have to do this one of these days to take the time and trouble, is I'm going to have to redo both um, versions of coils in Paul Falstead's simulator, in my, you know, mirror of his simulator, and add series resistance. I could add the option for capacitive resistance as well. You know, LT Spice allows you to do that, and I always got better results not to put in series resistance, but to put in two resistors in series, and i thinking at the time that that's equivalent, and it's not, because that still retains the superconducting state of the coil, and you're just putting a resistor alongside it. So it's not the same, because that means the coils can behave as if they're you know, they have absolutely no resistance of their own, and that's not, and, and so they will do things that a normal con uh, inductor in the real world will not do. And the same goes for the capacitor, too. I, well, no, the capacitor doesn't have series resistance. No, it's, ultimately, it's the inductor that chews up the production of energy, the synthesis of electricity. And so, if I can't put, if I don't have series resistance in my coils, you know, my single inductors as well as my transformer inductors, then it's no small wonder that I get such good results. And when somebody tries to build it like somebody did recently and not get any results, it's no small wonder.
that's a major problem in Paul Falstad's simulator, and it's something I should address. And now that I'm mentioning it, I'm setting myself up to be committed, you know? <laughs> now that I'm admitting to you openly a, a feature, a specific detail that I know is, r is faulty, I have very strong r suspicion to believe so. You know, because it makes logical sense the way I, you know, y I th you think it, uh, I think it through. So now I, I pretty much have to go in and do it. Um, it may not be as hard as I think, but it might take a whole day or two days, you know, maybe three at the most to figure out how to do it because his uh, coils don't have that ability to add in series resistance. Now, since a transformer already has windows, and I've already monkeyed with this window here, um, changing its parameters, um, then it, it shouldn't be too hard for the transformer to add a, uh, a edit, editable <laughs> um, variable that's not there already. And then go over to resistor um, components in his simulator and add the equations for resistance you know just copy and paste them over to the transformer but to do it in the single coil the single inductor where is it here add an inductor to do it to this means I've got a oh it already has one window edit editable window the Henry window <laughs> So I'll just have to add one. Yeah, it should be doable then. Oh, so I'm worried for nothing. <laughs> Good thing I did that. Okay. <laughs> so that's something I'll have to do. And then go in and redo my this latest simula simulation, for instance, and see if adding a series resistance and taking away these additional resistors has any deleterious effect in making it more difficult or impossible to create, you know, to synthesize electricity. You know, what to what extremes do I have to go to overcome that difficulty? I don't know. What <laughs> what awaits me? But that's something I'll have to do. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, I didn't try trying uh, trying to change these transformers to make them one to one ratio. You know, originally I tried to do that just on the simple mag amp that ends here, and it didn't work. I have to have this ratio of 1600 to 1. Um, so I'm not sure I'd what impact they would have on all of these, quite frankly. Um, because, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe I could get away with it, and that would make it easier to build the, the darn thing, is to make them 1 to 1 ratio. So I might want to try that tomorrow. I think I've done enough work for today that I'm not going to try that. Um, so that would be a modification of this circuit if it works. And so I won't have to do a new circuit altogether. I, I don't think I'd bother. Um, but to change the nature of coils uh, might be a good idea to make a whole new circuit. Yeah, because I'd be taking out resistors. So that definitely qualifies as a new circuit at the very least. Um, well, yeah, and just, you know, ch and in one sense, and then, but at least in another sense, you know, changing the, tra the transformer coils definitely in itself would also be a reason to make a whole new circuit. So that will be another day, but first I have to, you know, <laughs> succeed at doing this in, uh, in the simulation code, in the simulator's code. Not the simulations code. <laughs> Simulation meaning, you know, this implying the circuit. No, not the circuit. <laughs> Just the simulator behind the circuit. Um, so here's my little PayPal me link. You know, donate to me for all the work I do. Because um, I am doing the best I can with my limited knowledge and my ample amount of semi-retirement time <laughs> to, to devote to this um, subject because I don't see other people simulating free energy. I don't see anybody f simulating free energy. Everybody's trying to build something. But to me, that's kind of screwy because we're not trained. You know, we're not taught in school. 
And if you try to listen to somebody else, how do you know what they're saying is valid? What what if they're just screwing us? You know, at least the simulator might show some possibility, some hope that it might be possible to do it a certain way. Of course, you're limited to what the simulator provides you. You know, when you start wrapping coils and transformers in a very unique way and whatnot, then that makes it a little more difficult because the simulator only gives you, in this case, two choices. A sim- you know, well, they give you two different transformers, but they're pretty much the same. You know, in this case, I uh, stuck with um, two transformers here instead of a single transformer with a split core because the split core is only on one side. See, so that's a limit of Paul Falstead's electronic simulator. He doesn't give you a, the option to have the core split on both sides of the transformer. So I couldn't do that possibility here. Um, let's see. The power factor is unity because... Why? Why did I put that statement there? Oh, there was a reason. Yeah, I forgot what the reason is. Um, there is a reason, though. Huh. I forgot the definition of what power factor means. Oh, because I'm scoping the resistors, not the inductors, and not the capacitors, because by themselves, inductors and and capacitors have a skewed vision of the reality of the entire circuit. They skew it a certain way. They either put the, in the case of the capacitor, they might put the amps ahead of the volts uh, by 90 degrees out of phase, and the inductors and the AC sources, you know, if you had an AC source here, um, would put the uh, volts ahead of the amps by 90 degrees. So I figured out the hard way that that's one of the problems of the simulator is that it doesn't give you, there's maybe a piece of wire. Well, see, a resistor is like a piece of wire. It doesn't skew the uh, what's passing through it. It doesn't contribute to skewing what's passing through it. So from now on, that's what I do. I look at the resistors and I ignore what's going on with the inductors and capacitors if I want to determine what is the power factor. And so that means a lot of my circuits are a power factor of unity. They just don't say that because I'm always taking a reading of the inductor and the capacitor instead of the resistors adjacent to it or the piece of wire adjacent to it. So, you know, that's something, that's another limitation of the scoping ability for Paul Falstead's electronic simulator. And that's something now I have to make a habit of um, accommodating. Um, So there are problems, obviously, limitations, challenges. Um, I've changed the text a little. Uh, (laughs) So uh, let's see. Let's get a variety that has the the new text. Uh, Where did I put it? Well, it should be here now all the way down to here. So, this simulation is set to run at around, it's around 368 kilohertz, uh, but you won't see that here because the waveform is so slow, it's so drawn out across the entire width of the simulator that you're not gonna, it's not gonna be able to tell you the frequency. Um, And less than 22 million RPM with fluidic transmission featuring two bladeless turbines of Nikola Tesla at either end of a fluid-filled conduit. And Eric Dollard actually, I thought I originated that I- this idea myself, but it turns out Eric Dollard had, had already come up with it some time ago and mentioned it some time ago. And what you do is you, in- you increase or decrease the radius or diameter, if you prefer, of the stack of disks, the bladeless disks of each Tesla turbine at either s- end of the fluid-filled conduit. In other words, you know, you have when you have electrical conduit in a building in the house wiring, it's just a pipe, either plastic or um, aluminum, I believe, um, that kind of snakes. You know, it's 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 linked in in segments so that you can snake it, and you run all your house wiring uh, inside that conduit, and that protects the conduit, um, and it helps uh, organize. Uh, or excuse me, it protects the the house wiring and it organizes them so that um, you have them all in one place. And so if the conduit is a different type, instead of filled with wires or gears, you know, gearbox, instead it's filled with fluid, a viscous fluid preferably, 
like oil, let's say mineral oil or motor oil, then and then when you have uh, bladeless turbines, which is basically a stack of discs at either end, and one stack of discs has a greater diameter than the other, then we've got a gear, uh, a, 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 a gearing, you know, a, a gear, uh, a gear a s an analog to a mechanical gearbox, but it's done with fluid instead of gears, and gears would be a nightmare. And Eric said so, and I suspected that. That's why I came up with this idea. Um, so it shows I was connected <laughs> to the same consciousness that he's connected to, s or else I wouldn't have come up with the same idea after he already came up with it. So I it shows, you see, it shows that when people think about something, it makes it easier for the next person to think about it. Even though they're not related, they don't know each other, um, you know, it's always harder for the first one to break the ice of, c of our consciousness and think a new thought that we haven't thought of <laughs> for thousands of years maybe at the very least or maybe not at all and once that person you know is at the lead of the v-shape of uh you know geese flying you know he's <laughs> he or she is is um making it easier for everybody behind him then you get that v formation because they're flying in the wake of the lead bird and that's what Eric, I think, has managed to do. Now, Tesla probably did it too, actually, well, when I think about it. No, Tesla was the first, but he didn't talk about it. At least Eric talks about it. And so, you, sh you see, it made it easier for it, to, for it to be communicated because Eric came along after Tesla to revive a, a lot of wor Tesla's work. Um, uh, uh, in many cases, automatically, d without realizing what he was doing initially when he was younger. So it makes it easier for each of us, as we talk about it and think about it, for the next person to come along and talk about it and think about it um, with less internal resistance and less collective or cultural resistance all the way around. It just makes it easier for all of us. So every uh, contribution helps. It doesn't really matter how little I accomplish. It matters that I contribute anything Anything I contribute will help make it easier for other people to some degree or another. So I don't have to succeed. I don't have to fulfill the criticisms that it's not realistic what I do, it's not buildable, it's not true to the nature of electrodynamics as we know it in the real world. None of that matters. Anything I do will make it easier to, to for somebody else's, <laughs> multiple people, in all likelihood, to resolve all those criticisms one at a time or in sets or all of them at once. I, so, you know, criticism in the long view doesn't matter. It can be swept aside as that kind of criticism can be swept aside because it's not germane to what I focus on. And so it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. It has to do with the fact that the person doing the criticism is, n is failing to do that <laughs> and doesn't want to and is whining, basically. They don't want to do the work to contribute. So, you know, that's fine. They don't have to. They could ke keep their mouth shut, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make it easier for all the rest of us who are working hard, you know, not getting... They're not complaining. None of them has complained that I'm not getting paid for this, you know? Not a single one has mentioned, oh, wha you're such a stupid jerk. Why are you putting in all this time doing it for free? Why? Because they f keep finding fault in other ways that uh, they think are more significant than the fact that I'm doing this for free. I think they're leaving out the most important thing is the motivation. I'm doing it for the love of the work alone. And that it means I'm not tied to the clock and I can spend as much time as I want. And I did in the beginning. I spent so much time that I really ruined my health. And now I take it easy. And I don't do too much work, and I take a, uh, pauses in between, in which I just chill out, you know. So, um, it's interesting to point out that these components are very highly charged. Well, not this one. All right, how about this one? Well, it used to be. Huh, they're very low charge. It used to be higher. Oh, that's because I've made changes. Okay, so that was, 
Yeah, a prior version. Okay, so that doesn't apply. Scratch that. <laughs> yeah, when I had this running under different circumstances, these lit up components were extremely highly charged and it stayed here and didn't go anywhere. But these are very low charges, so that's good. I didn't I didn't know that. Um, unfortunately, this is for a single phase AC induction motor. It's not designed for a three phase or any other kind of motor. Um, sorry <laughs> to disappoint you because so many people want oh we want three phase and well it's sorry it just <laughs> I, I i had enough trouble just coming up with an ac output this has been so i i'm just such an ignoramus you know i'm i'm and i'm not used to using diodes because the simulator normally does not encourage it it usually discourages the use of diodes let alone multiple diodes um, it really taxes the simulator's ability to process all of the calculations um, in an ongoing fashion to use diodes. It just, the way I use them, you know, the way, I, you know, join to LMD analog computer, which is already a complication in itself and, and taxes the simulator's ability to calculate. Uh, let's see, I put this transformer here because I need to show the poor coupling between the rotor and the stator and and still show that it works regardless you know so i gave up trying to scope any resistor on the left hand side and instead just stuck with the right hand side because the left hand side of course is perfect and the right hand side is a diminished value that's skewed and weird you know the left hand side the top half and the bottom half of the tracing is pretty much equal it's when you get over to the right-hand side after you go through a poor coupling coefficient that it starts to become skewed. You know, the bottom side is less than the top side. So, you know, that's <laughs> the real a little bit of reality uh, right there, see? So I'm able to put in some reality. I try to put in as much as I can. Um, let's see what else. Oh, this is, this is a mistake. Uh, did we make note? No, I did not. Draw it, draw it to your attention. I hadn't changed that link yet, so let's go and look at that link. So I only have one. It's called is.gd forward slash ideal pa, and because I could not do the Java version, um, yeah, ideal ev is a different circuit. Uh, it's basically this, but without all these loops, these LMD uh, modules attached. And of course, it had the battery, which was a little extra tweak, but it really wasn't too important. I have to keep pretty much one simulator open on one tab of my browser because if I have more than one, it actually taxes each each other because these simulators run all the time. If I blank this out, you know, if I load a blank circuit, it the simulator is still running because it's constantly reviewing the situation to see if you've drawn anything, did you click on any buttons, you know? So, did you do anything down here? So, it, it's, um, it's always running. <laughs> and when you have multiple tabs, and it's tax, one tab alone is already taxing the browser to add in multiple tabs and to have them just sitting there already taxes each other. But in this case, this one's being taxed because I'm filming. I'm taking a video of this. Um, I think I've covered everything that I want to say. Um, there is a link for AC induction motors. You, I'm not going to look it up, and I'm not going to put it in. You just Google it, you know, and study if you don't know AC induction motors. They have four coils in two pairs. They have the, um, the main pair, and then they have the auxiliary pair that helps get it started in the right direction so that it just doesn't sit there and wiggle um, and not rotate. You know, or, or if it doesn't have a pair of auxiliary coils, then you can use a starter motor, excuse me, or you just hand crank it, <laughs> which is, of course is dangerous. An electric starter motor is a better idea. But the electric starter motor now has to have uh, two sets of coils if it's a DC. Um, no, excuse me, if it's an AC. Oh, right. Oh, the starter motor would be a DC motor. That's right. Oh, and that will get it to rotate in one direction. Oh, that's smart. 
So you could have a DC starter motor, or it has a pair of a second pair of auxiliary coils to help it get started properly. And that's actually a Tesla invention um, to put in auxiliary coils to get the AC motor to rotate in the direction you want it to. Interestingly enough. All right, now I think I'll shut up. <laughs>